Today, we're going to explore a couple of techniques that we can use to find broken access control that aren't just IDOR. Both of these are things that I've seen at some point in the past in real world applications, and I've put together a lab so that we can see them working and try and understand what's happening under the hood. And of course, as we go through the video, don't forget to update your notes so that you can test for similar issues going forward. If you enjoyed the video, then don't forget to like and subscribe and let's dive in. So just quickly before we spin up the lab, let's talk about the difference between authentication and authorization and access control. So authorization and access control are the same thing, but authentication is all about who you are. It's your identity. So when you check into a hotel, they might ask to see your ID, like your driver's license or passport. And this is them verifying you are who you say you are. You're verifying your identity. And this is authentication. Now, authorization or access control is what you're allowed to do. So once you've checked into your hotel, you get a key card and this gives you access to your room and maybe the pool or the gym or the restaurant or whatever. So authorization and access control is all about what privileges or what permissions you have. So as cyber threats grow, so does the need for skilled professionals. TCM security certifications are here to elevate your skills to meet these challenges. Our courses are tailored to give you an edge with practical scenario-based exams. Step into the world of advanced cybersecurity at certifications.tcm-sec.com and make your mark. Don't get those two confused and let's jump into the lab. So let's do node app.js to spin this up. And let's also just spin up Burp Suite very quickly. Next, start Burp Suite. And we're gonna come into proxy and we're just gonna open up the Burp Suite browser and then come to localhost 3000. So here I already have a JSON web token saved in the browser because I run a lot of stuff on localhost 3000. So I'm just gonna log out because it'll be an invalid token probably. And so let's come into register and let's register alex at alex.com and we just do password and password like this. And we have some to do items. So what I'm gonna do is just add make coffee and let's put this as the 29th, the 11th, 2024. And this is for my health and well-being. So we've added a to-do item. And what I'm going to do now is just log out and register another account, jeremy at jeremy.com. Jeremy and his password can also be password. So here we're looking at this part of the application. Later on, we'll explore the account page as well. But I think for now we should be all good. And we can come into HTTP history and we can start inspecting the requests and responses. So here we've got our make coffee request and we've got the title, the due date and the tags, and we get back an ID and a title and a due date and the tags. And then of course we registered a new account and then this looks like we just get slash APIs and this just returns all the to-dos based on the current user. And you can see here that we're using a JSON web token uh, to identify who we are. So the first attack that I wanna talk to you about is that especially when you're dealing with APIs, sometimes you'll find endpoints that, that the front end doesn't use but there is still functionality on the back end. So as we can see in our application, once we've added a to-do list item, so Jeremy is just gonna drink water, and this is also gonna be 29-11-2024, and let's just add the tag water. As you can see, we can add items, but we can't change, modify, delete, or anything else. And whenever you have an API endpoint, you probably always want to test different HTTP verbs. Now, obviously with GraphQL, it's a little bit different because it's everything's on a single endpoint, but with REST APIs, we'll often have get, post, put, delete, et cetera, et cetera. So let's grab this one and notice that we're obviously still using this token here. So what we want to do is try and change this to puts and let's just see what happens. So it comes back 
400 bad requests. But interestingly enough, it tells us that an ID is required. And we know that the ID of the first item was one because we can see that in the proxy here and we get back the ID of the object that we just created. And so since we're logged in as Alex, let's try modifying the second item, which would be Jeremy's water like this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pass in ID. We're going to try lowercase first. It might be that it needs to be uppercase, for example, but let's just do this and let's try and target ID two. Now, if you have a JSON web token plugin, you can obviously read this very quickly or we can decode this or we can send it to something like token.dev or jwt.io to verify, but very quickly, let's just echo this to base64 decode. And you can just see that here in the claims, we have ID one, email is Alex, and the issued at time and the expiry as well. So just to confirm, because sometimes when we're doing this, we might get a little bit confused. Oh, and actually if you have the intruder inspector panel open, which my face is covering up, it's automatically decoded here for you. So that's quite nice as well. I usually close the inspector panel, so there we go. So let's try this here. And it looks like, let's train this to no water only coffee and come back to the application. And let's log back in as Jeremy, Jeremy at jeremy.com and password. And here we have Jeremy's to-do item updated by Alex. And once again, that's because we found this hidden put endpoint and obviously does not use the authentication middleware as the other endpoints do. And we can see this in the code real quick. So for example, if we come here, we've got a bunch of endpoints, API to-dos. Here's the puts API, so we can see app.put slash API slash to do's. And here in app.post, we can see whether we've got this authenticate token middleware. And obviously in the app.put, we are missing this middleware. So to fix this, we one need to authenticate the token so that not anybody can just put to here. And then we also need to do a check to make sure the ID of the to-do item that's being impacted actually belongs to the user. So there are a couple of things to do to fix this endpoints. All right, next up is a really important one. And that is whenever you have a multi-step sequence, you need to thoroughly test because there are often mistakes that occur whenever we have an application that uses multiple step sequences, whether it's like a sign up phase or whether it's like a checkout or whether it's like a, you go to a basket payment, blah, 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 whatever it might be. And you always need to check these for bugs because multi-step sequences are complicated to implement correctly and can introduce all sorts of issues into an application. So here, if we come to accounts, let's log back in as me. So alex at alex.com and we come to the accounts. Here we have a change password. So what we first want to do is step through the application. So our current password is password and we can verify this. And now we get step two. So enter your new password. So I'm just going to put this as let me in like this and then update and we get password updated successfully. Now, if we come back to web suites and come proxy HTTP history, we can have a look at these requests. So first up, we have the current password and this passes back a reset token. So this is kind of important, I think, to take a look at. And then next up, we have the reset token. We have the new password and then we have the user ID. And there's a couple of red flags here. So the first red flag being why would we need the user ID when we actually have our token here? And obviously the application should be using the token to update the password. And also this reset token doesn't look that long or complicated. So it might be susceptible to brute force, for example. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna send this to repeater and think about all of the things that we need to check. So obviously we need to check whether we can impact different users. We need to check whether we can just send no reset token. Can we set it to null? Can we set it to minus one? Can we set it to, is there a, to is there a token that's valid and it always stays valid or is it one time use? Do we need to generate one with another user account? Can we use that with a different user account, for example? Whenever it comes to testing tokens, there's always a lot of edge cases to think about. Obviously, if you can do code review, that's gonna 
make things a little bit quicker. But my point is here in this multi-step sequence, there's a lot of stuff to look at and you're probably going to find issues. So here, what I want to do is try and make sure that this reset token is working correctly. And since we come back to proxy, we obviously have got this reset token and then it comes back. It should be a one-time use. So here, what I'm gonna do is change my password back to password and it says password updated successfully. So let's, so let's verify this in the front end like this. So that did indeed work. And then just to see, to double check, we can do password one, two, three, and it looks like that also worked. So indeed the token either lives forever or maybe is not checked or not needed. So yeah, it looks like this is completely redundant in fact. So whenever you get a token, check to see whether it's one time use, check to see whether you actually need the token, check to see whether it's valid for all users, check to see whether you can do things like pass null or zero or minus one to invoke some different behavior within the application. And then of course, we want to do the other obvious checks too. So for example, can we change the user ID to a different user? Can we impact other users within the application. But what I really want you to get into the mindset of is understanding how we can play around with different tokens and different variables or different properties that are under our control. Now, if you want to have a look at the lab yourself, then it will be up on my GitHub at some point over the next week. You're welcome to download it, use it, have a play with it. The front end is in Vue and the back end is as you've seen in Node.js. Nothing too complicated, but of course you're welcome to go in and play with it. And that's it for today. And that's it for today's video. Once again, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you have an interesting broken access control story or situation or vulnerability, then let us know down in the comments below. Catch you next time.